let's get over to segment number one, which is our rivalry loser support group. I thought this is going to be kind of a fun play on words there. But, uh, you know, last week was, or last Saturday was the rivalry week. And, you know, you had some people who won, like our Clemson Tigers. And then you had some teams that didn't do so well. And some of them were pretty surprising that they didn't do so well. Some of them that we picked to actually win the game in our uh, picks against the spread segment that ended up not actually winning the game. And so we wanted to kind of go through them, give you a little bit about the good and bad from the game, and then also kind of give you an insight on what they look like going into the future, into the 2020 season. And I'll start it off with the biggest team to earn a loss, I guess you could say, earn a quality loss. (laughs) <laughs> and that was Alabama. The Crimson Tide, they ended up putting up more total yards than Auburn, 515 total yards. They had more first downs than Auburn. And they actually had time of possession 11 minutes more than Auburn. But on the flip side, Mac Jones threw two pick sixes, which if you throw pick six one, it's, d- it's difficult to win any game. Yeah. You throw two of them, especially one that was awesome. It was kind of like off of his butt or his lower back bounced into the guy's hand and he ran it back for 100 yards. That's kind of plays you don't normally see, but it's just really cool to see when they do happen. But uh, two pick sixes and then a missed field goal. Man, how many times does Clemson or Alabama miss a field goal? And it doesn't seem to matter. But in this case, it did matter, and they ended up losing. Al, what were your quick thoughts on the game, and what do you see them going into next year? Because some people are saying Alabama has now slipped, and they're not going to come back anytime soon. The dynasty is over. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. I think uh, the game is much like you described it. I mean, those big mistakes for for, uh, for Alabama really cost them. Obviously, the refs gave Auburn a little push there for that halftime field goal. Uh, which I think was was garbage, and I'm not one to side with Alabama, but that was uh, that was kind of rough for him. And of course, the missed field goal uh, as well. It's just it's just crazy. It's just one of the, those nights where the Knicks finally did fly Alabama's away. It doesn't happen very often. But uh, as you said, you know, is the tie dynasty over? Uh, you know, I think more signs right now point to yes uh, than no. And and it's not to say that you know Alabama's you know all of a sudden going to drop out of the top 25. I would imagine they're going to be a, a contender as usual. But, I mean, they lose a ton on offense this year. Obviously, two will be gone. You know, their wide receivers, they had a ton of big-time, you know, um, upperclassmen receivers. They are gone. Okay, that's uh, that's going to be some huge losses for them there. And then you've got a defense coming back next year that, well, really wasn't all that good this year, to be honest. Uh, that's kind of been one of their weak points all the, this year, even when they've, you know, when they've played any decent kind of offense. They've given up a ton of points. Uh, so it's, it's not a strength. So I'm not really sure what they're looking like coming into next year. I don't think there's a lot of – I don't want to say there's not a lot of hope because, again, they're Alabama. They're going to be up at the top of the West. But it's LSU's emergence, I think, more than anything that's going to be kind of tough for them. Uh, you know, they they took Joe Burrow, who didn't do anything for his first few years, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, he kills it this year. Absolutely uh, a stud, you know, going to be top of the Heisman list, that kind of stuff. He's just kind of come out of nowhere. Um, I think they're going to kind of ride the hot streak, ride the momentum, you know, get some big-time recruits uh, from all this. And, uh, you know, I think people are kind of – thirsty for somebody other than Alabama to be that team. And I think LSU has a good chance to do it in the West here for the near future. Next one up, this was more of a a shock. We we're, were all kind of shocked on this when we picked this team. This is from the ACC, but you can't never pick, you can't really ever pick anything from the Coastal Division, really, to be <laughs> honest. Virginia Tech, all right, so we didn't expect them to be good this year. Um, we didn't expect them to be in the race for the division. They lost to BC at the first game of the year. They got destroyed by Duke. They struggled against Old Dominion. They struggled against Furman. Mm -hmm. Um, Furman actually, I believe, was winning at halftime. Um, And then they changed over to Hendon Hooker, and the team just seemed to take off. Now, the bad thing is Bud Foster's retiring. Virginia Tech ended up losing a really cool battle. I mean, it was a good battle. They just could not stop Bryce Perkins. I think the future looks bright for Virginia Tech, but what do you think? Yeah, I think they're on the right track. Uh, It's kind of been a long time coming for them. You know, they used to be obviously a dominant program, 10 wins every season they play in Beamer Ball. Uh, You know, like you said, you know, they finally snapped the 15-game losing streak uh, to Virginia Tech. Virginia did a a really good job there. A lot of of third and longs that were converted by long runs, you know, chunk yardage from uh, Bryce Perkins. He did an awesome job there. Uh, Hokies had some turnover trouble as well. I think they had two fumbles, two INTs, you know, including that costly one at the end, obviously, that fell in the end zone uh, and Virginia cover for a touchdown to kind of seal it. Uh, but, yeah, I think they've got some hope going forward. It's, it's you know, they only replaced one guy on defense, um, and that's uh, Reggie Floyd. So, I mean, really, you know, that could be a really uh, like a strong point for them next year. But, you know, 
is it going to matter that Bud Foster is not there? Was he kind of the key to this whole defense? Was it more players? Was it more scheme? We're about to find out, okay, because they're going to have the same players next year, but you're going to have a completely different guy there calling the shots. Yeah, I'm excited for that. I think that Virginia Tech is definitely a team that has a bright future with Hendon Hooker. They don't really have that good of an, uh, a recruiting class right now, 77th overall uh, yeah. per rivals, but they were in the top 30 the last three years. So I feel like that there's still some some ground to be made up there for uh, Justin Fuente there and uh, the Hokies. Next one I had on my list was Michigan, a team that I think we all picked to lose the game. Uh, Shea Patterson came out starting pretty strong, pretty hot, 250 yards passing in the first half alone. But the bad is that they gave up 577 yards total and 56 points to Ohio State. Some people are saying, hey, this is a new Michigan team, but same same results. No defense, no running game, still can't beat Ohio State. They have a top 10 class this, this year and last year, but some people are still scratching their head, can – can um, Jim Harbaugh do what it needs to do to beat Ohio State and take control of their division in uh, the Big Ten? Yeah, obviously in that game, that was an interesting game. They kind of kept it close there early. On, uh, the turnover in, inside the red zone really cost them there early in the game, kind of completely switched the momentum, and Ohio State just kind of uh, you know ran away with it from there. Uh, Buckeyes won eight in a row, like you said. Uh, you know, this is and some of those haven't even been close. About half of them haven't even really been close. Uh, so they have completely been dominant over the Wolverines. It's kind of uh, a way to, you know, hang their head in shame. I mean, Jim Harbaugh cannot get over that hump at all. And next year, uh, they lose three of their starting linebackers, which is tough because they run the 3-4 scheme. You know, that's 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 really difficult to replace all that talent there. So it's going to be a, a, a little bit of a different story from next year. I think their defense will obviously take a step back. I don't see how you lose three or four starting linebackers in a 3-4 and not take a step back. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting to see what they do. Um, I'm actually going to be really interested to see this offseason if Jim Harbaugh's seat becomes a little bit hotter than it has been. Next team up on my list is one that's uh, kind of a team that, that we're familiar with because Clemson played this year and, and last year, and, and the coach, someone who uh, Dabo Sweeney is very familiar with, and Jimbo Fisher, um, they just got destroyed by LSU. They seem to – be one of those front runners in the West. We're going to con contend with the West, mm -hmm. but then couldn't win any big games really and had a, a struggle to get anything going on the offense, struggle with the offensive line, struggle with the running backs. Um, Kellen Mond looked scared most of the time when he was in, in clutch situations, didn't know what to do, but they have a top five recruiting class right now. Uh, sixth overall recruiting class last year. They're bringing in a pair of really good wide receivers in this next uh, as freshmen coming in. But do you think that Texas A&M has what it takes? Jimbo Fisher's making a lot of money over there. Mm -hmm. Do you think it ha they have what it takes to and you know fight can to fight consistently with Alabama and now LSU? Well, next year I think it's going to be a really good shot. If they can just get any kind of consistency at quarterback, if they can get any kind of consistency from Kellen Mond, obviously we see some of the games he has, like you know Clemson last year or something like that, where he just goes off. And then he'll just be completely dormant for an entire game. If they can get more consistency out of him, I think they have a good shot next year. They only lose one guy, Colton Prater, who's their center on offense. And on defense, uh, they have one senior de defensive end in Michael Clemens. Now, of course, this isn't accounting for any juniors that might go early or leave for, for you know transfer portal or anything like that. But those are the seniors on the roster that we know they're going to lose. It's one on offense, one on defense. Okay, so both units look to take a significant step forward. Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting battle next year, and I think uh, you're going to look at A&M and Alabama and LSU as kind of those top teams in the West. A team that people seem to care about a lot, you know, on the Clemson side of things is the other team in the state. They just played Clemson and got really – it really was an uneventful night, to be honest with you. I mean, they scored three points off of a field goal. But um, after the game, a lot of changes were made. Offensive coordinator Brian McClendon no longer going to be playing, uh, calling plays. They said he was fired, but then they said he might not be fired. He might still be on staff, but just not doing the same things that he was doing. The strength and conditioning coach, Jeff Dillman, gone. The quarterback coach, Dan Werner, out. And so a lot of shakeup over in Columbia. They're not going to go to a bowl. So this was the last game of the season for them. The game in itself was not exciting. wasn't even really that fun to – uh, watch the commercials in between the game. I just wanted to go and try to find another game that was on during that time slot. But uh, And then at the end, you know, fans weren't showing up. I mean, people were saying, Clemson fans were saying, let's go out there, let's paint it orange, and they definitely did. Majority yeah. of the stadium that was left towards the end of the game was in orange. <laughs> so 
Uh, next year for me, though, there's there's that bright shining star. There's that Luke uh, uh, Doty. Is that, am I saying it right? Luke Doty. Yep. Luke Doty, quarterback. Uh, Zach Pickens hopefully can get healthy and dominate in the defensive line that they expect him to do. They have number 19th ranked class in recruiting per rivals right now. So not a bad recruiting class. Mm -hmm. And they just upgraded their new facilities. I know that, uh, you know, ESPN loves love to talk about their facilities during the broadcast. Yeah. Uh, five or six times they talked about the facilities. So hopefully that will help. I know that um, Clemson built everything that they have now on their facilities and their slide, you know, but there's also some other things that they Clemson built their, their program on. And that's the culture. And I think you see that in the strength and condition, conditioning coach being let go because I've people have said in the, in, in the group chat and, and on Facebook, Twitter, what does it matter about the strength and conditioning coach? He's just there to, to, you know, help you lift weights, right? He's just there to, you know, keep you strong. That's, that is that could be further from the truth. Okay, the strength and conditioning coach really is the one coach that can hang out with the players almost the entire year. Right. Now, players can't always pick up a football and go, and coaches can't always watch them do, run plays or um, go through a playbook. They can't always be in meetings, but they typically, no matter what the NCAA rules are, they typically can go to the weight room. And you got to have that guy in there, that that strength and conditioning guy, that builds up that kind of culture that you want. And so I think, I think that it is a showing sign that that's who, who they got rid of. One of the players, one of the, the coaches that they got rid of. Do you feel like that these are good moves for South Carolina? Do you feel like any, any, there's going to be any positive momentum if there can be any going into next year? Well, obviously, I guess time will tell on their moves and, and what they've done here. Uh, obviously, there's got to be a scapegoat. If the head coach doesn't go, there's got to be a scapegoat somewhere. So he found some. He got rid of them. He made some moves. Uh, you know, so we'll see if those will pay off for him in the end. Look, I think the biggest thing going into next year is the fact that they lose their top playmaker in Brian Edwards. They also lose their top two running backs in Rico Dowdle and Tavian Feaster. All right, they're all gone. So your offensive production is gone. They lose one guy on the offensive line, Donnell Stanley. Uh, the rest of their two deeps pretty intact there on the offensive line. Now, whether that's a good thing or not, I guess is debatable. They, they haven't been really world beaters there on offensive line. But that's going to be a huge deal. Can they, you know, are they going to stick with Ryan Helensky? Uh, are they going to, you know, bring a freshman along like Luke Doty? I think uh, Doty has a lot of ability. I still think Ryan Helensky has some ability as well. So we'll kind of uh, watch them duel it out, see how things go. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, they lose three, uh, you know, four starting linemen. Uh, Javon Kinlaw obviously being the big one. He's probably going to be a first-round draft pick this year. They'll lose uh, Smith and Wanham as well. Those are uh, Wanham's definitely a good playmaker. There's some ability there that they're going to lose. Uh, a lot of their impact is kind of going to be gone there. Um, they also lose linebacker T.J. Brunson as well. So, I mean, some of their main playmakers on offense and defense are going to be gone. Um, they actually have, like you said, a decent recruiting class. Uh, one of those running backs is going to be replaced by – it was a former five-star running back, Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, I think he's rated a four-star now, depending on which service you look at. So they have some talent coming in. Um, but, you know, in the schedule actually lightens up a bit, bit for them next year. I think they can get somewhere between five and seven wins. So it'll be probably an improvement over this year, but I don't know that it's going to be a huge step forward. And I think Muschamp's seat is going to be even hotter next year. 